Well, thank you very much for having me today. Thank you to uh, Professor uh, Tompio, and I've benefited very much from uh, our exchanges. And I'm very honored to be able to give a talk to his class today. And thank you to all the students who who showing up today. I'm going to be giving you kind of an introduction to Mungza, who is not as well known in the West as, for example, Confucius, the uh, Kungza, the founder of Confucianism. But in East Asia, not just in China, but throughout East Asia, Mengzi is referred to as the second sage of Confucianism, meaning the sage second in importance only to Confucius himself because of the depth of his ideas and the influence he had on the Confucian tradition. If you're conversant with the, the Christian tradition, uh, some people have drawn analogies between the role of Mengzi in the Confucian tradition and the role of uh, Paul, St. Paul, in the Christian tradition. So it's a very influential figure, and that's reflected in the fact that what we see here is a contemporary Chinese stamp. If you read Chinese, you'll recognize that it's part of a series of ancient thinkers. Um, and one of the ancient, the great ancient thinkers of China featured on the stamp is our guy Mengzi. So who is this, this figure, Mengzi, and, and why is he so important? Well, one of the things that Mengzi said uh, in his writings, he said, a sage king has not arisen. The various lords are dissipated. Pundits engage in contrary wrangling. The doctrines of Yangju and Mozi fill the world. Well, who are Yangju and Mozi? He says, if a doctrine does not lean toward Yang, then it leads towards Mo. Yang is for ourselves. This is to not have a ruler. Mo is impartial caring. This is to not have a father. To not have a father and to not have a ruler is to be an animal. Well, what does he mean in these claims he's making about his era? Sage King has not arisen, the various lords are dissipated. And who are these? figures, Yangju and Mozi, that he thinks dominate Chinese intellectual life and dominate Chinese intellectual life to the detriment of Chinese intellectual life. Well, to understand that, we need to understand Mengzi's context a little bit better. Mengzi lives in what is called the Warring States period in Chinese history. And the Warring States period is in the later part of the Zhou dynasty. So since it's the Zhou dynasty, you could probably guess, since it's a dynasty, that there must be a reigning king or queen. And in this case, it's a, it's a king. And so there is a reigning king of the Zhou dynasty during this era. But the king in this era reigns but does not rule. That is to say, although there is a king of China, uh, uh, the, Zhou, the reigning Zhou dynasty monarch, that king does not have effective power over China. The real power in China is in the hands of the rulers of the various states into which China is divided. They're usually dukes, and nominally they owe allegiance to the Zhou king, but over, and at a certain period in the early part of the Zhou dynasty that they actually did obey the king and were loyal to the king. But by this point in history, the dukes and the other rulers of the states realized that it really wasn't in their self-interest to obey the king. Eat, the rulers of each of these states raised their own taxes, they made their own laws. They had their own armies. So there was really no reason for them to be loyal to the Zhou king. And this led to a state where you have a bunch, or a situation in which you have a bunch of independent states, each of which has its own army, but no centralized authority between them. And so the various states began to fight with one another over territory, over wealth. And sometimes you would attack another state just preemptively to attack it before it had a chance to attack you. 
Um, so this is the Warring States period in which Mengzi lived. Now, just to give you a sense, these are this is an approximation of what the Warring States period states, what their areas of control were, superimposed over a map of the contemporary borders. So you can see the borders of the contemporary People's Republic of China. Uh, Taiwan is off the coast there uh, to the east. The Korean Peninsula with North and South Korea is, is up there um, in the northeast. Uh, Vietnam is to the, the south. If you go off to the west, India is there. If you go north, that's Mongolia. And, beneath, and below, beyond that, there's Russia. So those are the, just a sense of how this fits in the contemporary borders. So what was China like during the Warring States period? Well, again, each of these states is vying for supremacy with the other states. Within the states, uh, even the rulers of the states are not secure because not only are they facing invasion from other states, but their own subordinates might choose to kill them so that they could become the ruler of the state. Or a younger brother might try to kill his older brother so that he becomes the reigning duke. And most people are very poor because the governments are taxing people heavily to pay for large standing armies and also to pay for luxuries for the aristocratic class. But even if you're an aristocrat or you're rich, you can't feel safe because someone might kill you for your status or kill you because you're perceived to be too powerful in the state or kill you to seize your wealth. So in a way, everybody's suffering. And one classic work in this period, which you, you might have heard of, it's okay if you haven't, the Tao Te Ching, the classic of the way and virtue attributed to Lao Tzu, described the situation in following terms. It says, the court is resplendent, yet the fields are overgrown. The granaries are empty, yet some wear elegant clothes. Fine swords dangle at their sides. They are stuffed with food and drink and possess wealth and abundance. This is known as taking pride in robbery. Far is this from the way. So it describes a situation in which they live in a society where there's a handful of people who have immense amounts of wealth and privilege, and then lots of people who are much more poor. Wow, imagine living in a society like that. Um, and the Tao Te Ching says this situation is far from the way. What does the way mean? Why do we capitalize it here? The way means the right way to live and the right way to organize society. It comes to have an association with a transcendent entity, the way, which existed before heaven and earth, which is responsible for the right way to live and the right way to organize society. But the, the original meaning, um, or one of the original meanings is really the right way to live and the right way to organize society. And the Tao Te Ching attributed to Lao Tzu saying, the way society is organized right now is not the right way, the right way to live, the right way to organize society. So during this period, you got lots of philosophers who were arguing about what is the right way to live and the right way to organize society. And how can we get out of this state of social crisis? Now, I often tell my students that there's this mistaken impression people have that philosophy is something, and pardon my language here, but it's just about BSing when you don't have anything better to do and you know, what you're saying doesn't really make any difference is a description of what philosophy has been historically, nothing could be farther from the truth. People are driven to philosophize because they face serious problems in life and in society, and they're trying to figure out what's gone wrong and how do we fix it. And that's certainly true in China. In this situation of chaos and warfare, people said, so what is the right way to live? What is the right way to organize society? And one expression people use is they describe this as the Warring States period, but they also say it's the period of the hundred schools of philosophy, because there's so many different philosophical systems vying for supremacy and trying to convince people, no, I know what the way is. I know how to fix what's wrong with people's lives in China right now. 
although there were there weren't literally a hundred schools, well, it depends on how you count them, but there were a lot of them anyway. But only two schools survived into later Chinese thought: Confucianism and Taoism. You might be wondering about Buddhism. Buddhism came to China after this period, during the Han Dynasty, which was a later dynasty. And then later, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism come to be called the San Jiao, the three teachings of the Chinese tradition. But Buddhism came from India. Confucianism and Taoism are the indigenous, the native systems of philosophy that survived and continue to have an influence. And Confucianism is founded by this guy, Kongza, better known by the Jesuit Latinization of his name, Confucius. And we actually have pretty good dates on him. He probably lived from around 551 to 479 BC, or if you prefer, BCE. And his sayings and brief dialogues are recorded in a work known in Chinese as the Lunyu, but we know it in English as the Analect. Then after Kungza died, Mengzi was born and Mengzi really admired the teachings of Confucius and Mengzi's sayings and dialogues are recorded in the eponymous work, the Mengzi. Eponymous is just a fancy way of saying the work is named after the author, the, the reputed author. There's also one more major early Confucian whose works survive, and that's Shunzi. And Shunzi was also a Confucian, but a critic of Mengzi. Mengzi is famous for saying that human nature is good. Shunzi is famous for saying that human nature is bad. And Shunzi explicitly argued against Mengzi. We, we don't have time to look at Shunzi today, but there are selections from his works in readings in classical Chinese philosophy. Now, the supposed founder of Taoism is Lao Tzu, a traditionally said to be a slightly older contemporary of Confucius. And the work attributed to him is the Tao Te Ching, the classic of the way and virtue. Although honestly, in Chinese, sometimes the Tao Te Ching is just referred to eponymously as the Lao Tzu. And then there's a, a younger contemporary of Mengzi, by the name of Zhuangzi. And Zhuangzi's writings are the eponymous Zhuangzi. And uh, Zhuangzi is in many ways, he's in terms of time, he's again a younger contemporary of Mengzi. But Zhuangzi is also a critic of Confucian philosophy. And again, I have a, a separate lecture you can find on YouTube about Zhuangzi if you'd like to learn some more about it and the ways in which he critiques Mengzi's view. So Mengzi was really impressed by Kungzi and his teachings. So who was this guy Kungzi? Or again, we often know him as Confucius. He was, as we saw, born in a time of civil war and social chaos. And he looked around him and he said, well, what's wrong with society? What is the right way to live, the right way to organize things? And how can we get back to that? And his solution to the problems China faced was to cultivate virtue in individuals and get those virtuous individuals into positions of government authority. Now, uh, I know you guys have read a little bit of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with what's called Plato's seventh letter. And some scholars think it's authentic, some scholars think it's not. I'm inclined to think it is authentic. At the very least, I think it represents what was one common ancient view about Plato's philosophy. And the seventh letter purports to be a letter from Plato in which he explains, among other things, why he got interested in philosophy. And Plato says that he looked at the corruption and the vice in the society he lived in, ancient Athens, and he was driven to philosophize because he realized there would be no end to suffering for humans until either philosophers became rulers or rulers became philosophers. And what Plato means by a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, is not some nerd like me who just likes to read books and write articles about them. What Plato means by a philosopher is a truly virtuous individual. And 
In works like The Republic, Plato argues that in the ideal society, you will cultivate virtue in individuals, and the ones who are the best at cultivating virtues and achieve the highest level of virtue should have positions of authority in government. So at a certain structural level, there's an important similarity between the solution to society's problems that Kumza offers and the one that Plato offers. Well, great, we wanna have rule by virtuous individuals. Most of us don't start out virtuous, so how do we acquire virtue? Kumza argues that virtue can be taught by a combination of habituation, performing the right actions in the right way, and also the study of the classics of poetry and history. And you might think, how is this similar to, and in what other respects is it different from, the conceptions of ethical cultivation that we see in Plato and Aristotle? Aristotle certainly emphasizes habituation as a way of cultivating virtue, uh, but what about the role of classics of poetry and history? Remember that, in the Republic, Plato apparently bans the poets from the ideal state. So Confucius thinks we have to cultivate virtue in individuals, but he also thinks that one of the ways in which you learn virtue is in the family. It is by loving others and being loved by others in the family that you learn virtues like benevolence, that you develop compassion for others. It is by respecting others in the family and having them respect you that you develop integrity or righteousness or an ethically informed sense of shame. And as a result of that, Confucius believed that because it's in the family that we first learn virtue, that there are what we call using Western terminology, agent relative prohibitions and obligations. Agent relative prohibitions and obligations, that's just a fancy technical term, but all it means is that I have an obligation to care for my children because they are my children that I don't have to somebody else's children. And likewise, my children have an obligation to respect and care for me, which is stronger than their obligation to respect and care for other people of my age group. Now, this doesn't mean that I have no obligation to care for other people's kids, of course not. But intuitively, we normally think I do have more of an obligation to members of my family than I do to complete strangers, and they have more of an obligation to me. The technical way we express that in contemporary Western philosophy is we say, well, you have these agent relatives obligations, meaning they're obligations that depend on who you are in relation to someone else. And Confucius thought that you did have such obligations, and that's what he means in part by things like filial piety or loyalty. Now, after Confucius's death, his followers collected his sayings and his brief dialogues. And this work is, again, it's known in Chinese as the Lun Yu, but in English, we know it as the Analects. Not everybody agreed with Confucius though. And as I was telling you what Confucius thought, maybe you thought of some things that you disagreed with uh, about Confucius. And the first major critic of Confucianism whose work survives is this guy, Mozza. And you can see he also got a stamp in this ancient thinkers series in China. So he's the first major critic of Confucianism. His philosophy, I think, is a version of universal consequentialism. So when you start thinking about ethics, one of the natural things that often occurs to people when they're starting to think about ethics is, well, gee, why don't we just aim at some results or some consequences that we all agree would be good, and then we'll just judge maybe actions or rules or ways that you might live and organize society in terms of to what extent do they promote these consequences that we all agree would be good. And if you do that impartial without regard to whether I'm promoting the consequences for my family or your family or my country or your country, 
then it would be impartial or universal consequentialism. So what are the consequences that we should maximize? Mullins had talked about maximizing three goods, wealth, populousness, and social order. Now, if you know some Western philosophy, you might say, well, this universal consequentialism, that sounds kind of familiar. Isn't that just utilitarianism? Western utilitarianism in the form you see it in people like ben Jeremy Bentham or John Stuart Mill, or more recently, Peter Singer, is a kind of consequentialism. And Western utilitarianism, though, tends to emphasize um, and there's different ways you can formulate utilitarianism, but it's often classically formulated in terms of subjective states like maximizing pleasure or maximizing happiness, or more technically maximizing individual preference satisfaction and minimizing things like pain or unhappiness. But the, the problem that kind of system faces is it's hard to do interpersonal comparisons of things like pleasure and pain. How do I quantify how much pain a particular thing causes me and weigh that against the amount of pleasure the same course of action would cause you? If you're a utilitarianism, it seems like you gotta find some way of, of weighing these things. So Mauds have picked consequences that were in principle quantifiable. How much wealth does the society have? How big is the population? How much social order is there? And that might seem hard to quantify, but you can just say, well, how few murders and robberies and assaults are there in the society? It might seem surprising to you to see a Chinese thinker emphasizing maximizing populousness, because I don't know about you, but for much of my life, uh, I've thought of China as a country that's wrestling with overpopulation. But the thing is, in the Warring States period, and actually through a lot of Chinese history, the problem wasn't overpopulation. The problem was underpopulation. Because due to all the warfare and the diseases that often accompany the social disruption of warfare and the disruption of crop planting and harvesting that goes along with warfare, a problem people faced for much of Chinese history was underpopulation. There weren't enough people to actually farm the available farmland and to fill the available government offices. So populousness seemed like an intrinsically valuable thing in Mao's era. Now, again, I said earlier that Confucius thought you had these agent relative prohibitions and obligations. I have a special obligation to my kids just because they're my kids. My kids have a special obligation to me just because I'm their dad and the same thing with their mom. But Mozza advocated impartial caring. And one way of understanding what impartial caring is is that there are no agent relative prohibitions or, ob or obligations. You just have to maximize wealth, populousness and order for humans in general. And so perform the actions or follow the way that will maximize wealth, populousness, and order impartially for humans in general. Now, <clears throat> part of the way that Mozza got to this conclusion was he said that ethics has to be based on some standard that's purely impersonal. So he says, when one advances claims, one must first establish a standard of assessment. To make claims in the absence of such a standard is like trying to establish on the surface of a spinning potter's wheel where the sun will rise and set. Without a fixed standard, one cannot clearly ascertain what is right and wrong or what is beneficial and harmful. Oops, sorry. I hold to the will of heaven as a wheelwright holds to his compass and a carpenter to a square. And later in the passage that I'm, I'm quoting here, uh, particularly the, the first passage there, Mozza says you need a gauge in order to judge your theory. And the word he uses for gauge in Chinese is biao, which is now the word for watch or clock in Chinese. But originally, what Biao means is a gnomon. 
G-N-O-M-O-N. Now it's okay if you don't know what a gnomon is, but frankly, the fact that you don't know what a gnomon is shows that you are out of touch with your historical roots. Why? A gnomon is a, an astronomical instrument that lots of different civilizations independently discover. It's very simple. It's just a stick perpendicular to the ground. And you'd say, well, how is that a useful astronomical instrument? Well, on the right here, we've got an image from a traditional Chinese work showing two sages using a gnomon. And with the gnomon, by looking at the shadow on the gnomon, when the shadow on the gnomon is at its shortest, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, the shadow is pointing due north. Also, when the shadow is at its shortest, it is noon local time. And then if you measure the length of the shadow, by the position of the shadow, you can tell the time of day it is, and by the length of the shadow, you can tell where you are in the year. So this on the right is a picture from a traditional Chinese work of two sages using a gnomon to determine sunrise and sunset and the time of year. So Morgza is using these metaphors of technical standards like a, a wheelwright's compass, not a magnetic compass, although that was later invented in China first as well. This is like a compass that old people like me used to use when we had geometry class to draw a circle. Um, or a carpenter's square, like a T-square you use to draw a right angle. Or a gnomon that you use to determine when it is noon and what time it is and when, uh, where we are in the seasons of the year by the length of the shadow at various times. So Mozart says, ethics has to be based on an objective standard just like these other technical activities. And if it's gonna be an objective standard, it's got to be impartial. So Mozart says, those who accord with heaven's will, caring for one another impartially and benefiting one another in their interactions will surely be rewarded. How do we know that heaven cares for the people of the world? Our teacher Mozart says, because it sheds light upon all impartially. What does he mean by heaven here? So heaven in, or tian in classical Chinese, it can mean the skies above. Uh, and later, especially due to the influence of Buddhism, you get the expression tian tang, the halls of heaven, which refers to this place that the souls of the virtuous go after death. But in the period that we're looking at, like the, the later part of the Zhou dynasty, heaven is a higher power, almost like a god, and treated more or less anthropomorphically. Anthropomorphic means treating something that's not a human as if it were a human. And so some thinkers in this era treated heaven anthropomorphically as like a person, who had a personality and motives and things like that. Other thinkers treated it more abstractly, like you know the god of Spinoza or the god of Einstein, where it's kind of like a higher power, but you know, uh, you know, much not much like a personality. But in either case, heaven's a higher power that's responsible for the moral structure of the world. And Malta says plausibly, look. Uh, heaven sheds light on everybody impartially. So why would the moral standard that heaven gives us be anything other than completely impartial? There is no chosen people in, in this view of ethics. And so as a result, since your ethics is supposed to be maximally impartial, there are no agent relative obligations or prohibitions. And the business of the benevolent person is to promote what is beneficial to the world and eliminate what is harmful. And if we wish to distinguish those in the world who hate and steal from other people, do we refer to them as impartial or partial? We clearly must call them partial. And so it is those who are partial in their dealings with others, who show favoritism, who are the real cause of all the great harms in the world. This is why our teacher Mozart says, replace partiality with impartiality. If people regarded other people's states in the same way that they regard their own, who then would incite his own state to attack, attack that of another? 
for one would do for others as one would do for oneself. If people regarded other people's families in the same way that they regard their own, who then would incite their own family to attack that of another? For one would do for others as one would do for oneself. So again, we're gonna treat other people's families the same way we treat our own. I'm gonna treat other people's children the same way I treat my own. Other people's elderly the same way I treat my own elderly. Other people's states the same way I would treat my own states and just impartially maximize wealth, populousness and order for everybody without showing any favoritism. Now, Mozart was not the only critic of Confucianism. A, another figure uh, from the same century as Mengzi, but a bit older, is this guy, Yang Ju. Now, Yang Ju, you see here, this is an artist's representation of Yang Ju, but he doesn't get his own stamp. Why doesn't he get his own stamp? Well, I think you'll see why in a second. Yang Ju was, we think, an ethical egoist as opposed to a psychological egoist. Now, the distinction between ethical egoism and psychological egoism is one that philosophers are rather fond of. Um, and so an ethical egoist is someone who says, the only thing that you ought to do, the only thing that you ought to do is what will benefit you as an individual. Maybe what you do will benefit other people too, and there's nothing wrong with that if it does, but the only thing you ought to do is some things insofar as they benefit you. And this, people often conflate ethical egoism with psychological egoism, in common discussions, but they're actually quite different. A psychological egoist is somebody who says, the only motivation anybody has is the motivation to benefit themselves. Now, at first glance, you might think, oh, wait a second, aren't those exactly the same things? No, they're not. The ethical egoist does not deny that sometimes people are motivated to do things that don't benefit themselves. But the ethical egoist says, yeah, you might be motivated to do something that doesn't benefit yourself. You're a sucker for doing that though, because the only thing you ought to do is what benefits you. The psychological egoist says, it's really not relevant whether you ought to or ought not be motivated to benefit yourself. You are in, po in point of fact, only motivated to benefit yourself. Now, most philosophers don't take psychological egoism seriously, and we can talk about that in the question session if you want. Uh, but ethical egoism, you know, not all philosophers agree with it, but at least it's a defensible view. But Yang Ju was a very interesting kind of ethical egoist. So Yang Ju said, well, you should only do what benefits yourself. As a result, he it seems like he didn't bother to write his teachings down. And you might say, why not? All these other philosophers did. Yeah, all these other philosophers were concerned about the well-being of other people. So they wanted to share with other people their insights into the right way to live and the right way to organize society. But I think Yang Ju was like, what's in it for me? Why should I waste my time writing down something for you? What are you going to do for me for? Um, and also, he didn't really bother to have disciples because I think he was like, yeah, why should I waste my time training disciples? What's in it for me? You know what I'm saying? So... But the form that Yang Ju's egoism took was he said that human nature is purely self-interested. Now, again, you might be saying, well, wait a second, Van Orden, you told me this guy's an ethical egoist as opposed to psychological egoist. If he thinks that human nature is purely self-interested, doesn't that mean that he thinks all humans are motivated all the time by self-interest? No, he doesn't. Yang Ju apparently acknowledged that other people sometimes have motivations besides self-interest, but he said they were foolish for having them. So human nature is a normative concept. It's an ideal of what you would be like under ideal circumstances, but you can deviate from human nature. It's just if you deviate from human nature, you are in a technical sense perverted. An analogy I sometimes use is think of a bonsai tree. Have you ever seen one of these beautiful bonsai trees? And they're these, you know, trees that normally grow to a very great height, but because they're in shallow pots and they're trimmed very carefully, they're very beautiful, but they don't realize their nature as trees. 
that's part of what's fun about a bonsai tree is it doesn't, it looks like a full grown tree, but it's like six inches tall, but that's not the nature of the tree. But because the, the tree's nature has been warped by its environment, it fits in a tiny pot that could go on your desk. So Yongju's view about human nature was like that. He said, yeah, there are people out there who are motivated by things besides self-interest. That's a perversion of human nature. If you actually follow the nature that heaven gave you, you will act in a purely self-interested way. Now to, again, try to clarify a bit more the notion of nature or human nature, I'm giving you a quotation here. Um, and this one is not in readings in classical Chinese philosophy, it's in readings in later Chinese philosophy, which I co-edited with Justin Tewald. And this is not a youngest work that I'm quoting here, but this view of nature is one that was very common among Chinese thinkers. And I think you can find close analogs of it among Western thinkers like uh, Plato and Aristotle as well. So what this, this classic text says, the meaning, it says nature, the word nature means what is mandated by heaven. Remember heaven, that higher godlike power. So your nature is given to you by heaven. The way, the right way to live, the right way to organize society, means following one's nature. Education means cultivating the way in yourself. So all these concepts are kind of interlocked. There's a higher power heaven. It gives you a nature. That nature, following that nature is the right way to live. And education isn't just giving you value neutral skills, which is what many people today think education is. No, education is cultivating the right way to live in your character so you can fully realize your nature. So on this basic conception of the relationship of heaven, nature, the way, and education, a lot of Chinese thinkers are in agreement. But what's distinctive about Yang Ju, he disagrees with both the Moists and the Confucians because both of them in different ways thought that part of the way was to benefit others, whereas Yang Ju said, Hey, you want to follow your nature? Guess what? Just benefit yourself. What could be more natural, Yangju says, than merely benefiting yourself? Now, like I say, Yangju you know, couldn't be bothered to write his teachings down. And in a way, that's completely consistent with his philosophy. But we do have this dialogue between a robber, an infamous Chinese robber, Robert Jur and Confucius. Now this dialogue is apocryphal. It's, it's not real, it's fake, it's made up. But it's really a really great representation of what thinkers who may have been influenced by Yang Ju would have said in response to Confucius. And in this imaginary dialogue, uh, Confucius tries to persuade this notorious criminal, Robert Jur, to give up his life of crime. But Robert Jur, isn't having any of it. He shoots back to Confucius. He says, this is Robert Jura, uh, arguing against Confucius. Now, let me tell you something about the human essence, what a human really is. The eyes want to see colors. The ears want to hear sound. The mouth wants to taste flavors. And the emotions want fulfillment. People live at most 100 years, usually 80, sometimes 60. Subtracting time spent recovering from illness, mourning death, and fretting over worries. There are only four or five days a month people can open their mouths and laugh. Heaven and earth go on forever, but people die when their time comes. Put this perishable good in that eternal space, and its time flashes by like a galloping horse past a crack in the wall. Isn't that a great simile? He continues, if you're not gratifying your wishes and cherishing your days, then you do not understand the way. I reject everything you say. Go home right now without another word. This way of yours is a crazy, fraudulent, vain, empty, and artificial business. It's no way to fulfill your true self. So if you're a human who cares about something other than satisfying your own desires, then you're artificial. You're crazy you're not living up to your true self because your nature has been warped by social influences like the teachings of Confucianism or like the teachings of Moism, just like a bonsai tree is warped 
by the people who trim it and keep it in a really shallow pot to keep it from fully realizing its nature. Well, so Confucianism is under attack from Maoism, it's under attack from the Yangism and the people who were inspired by his ideas and into this environment is born this guy, Mengzi. He's a Confucian philosopher. He sees himself following in the Confucian tradition. I have a lot of my career has been arguing that he can be interpreted as a virtue ethicist. Um, if you're familiar with uh, a virtue ethics approach as opposed to a rule deontological approach or a consequentialist approach, that's the way I'm reading him. Uh, the, his cardinal virtues, meaning the virtues that Mengzi thinks are most important, and that in a sense encompass all the other human goods, are benevolence, righteousness, which is kind of like integrity, wisdom, and ritual propriety. And he argued that human nature is good, and he explained that what he means by saying that human nature is good is not that all humans are good already, but human nature is good in the sense that humans have innate but incipient dispositions towards virtue which he described using an agricultural metaphor is like sprouts. And just like the sprout of an apple tree isn't yet an apple tree, but the sprout of an apple tree has a potential, an active potential, if given the right environment to develop into an apple tree and bear fruit. So likewise, humans are born with these sprouts of virtues, these active but incipient tendencies towards virtue which given the right kind of cultivation can develop into full-blown virtues. But remember, oops, sorry, Mengzi also complained. This is a slide we saw before. He said, a sage king has not arisen. The various lords are dissipated. Pundits engage in contrary wrangling. He's describing the situation in the Warring States period where there's no ruler who's got the virtue to unify China. The lords of the various states are fighting one another and leading to suffering for everybody. There's the hundred schools of thought, all these different pundits, self-styled experts are telling you what the way is. But among the most influential of them are the doctrines of Yangju and Mozi, which fill the world. And now you can understand a little bit better what he means when he says that if a doctrine does not lean towards Yang, then it leans towards Mo. Yangju is for ourselves. This is egoism. This is to not have a ruler. Moa is impartial caring. This is to not have a father. In other words, no agent relative obligation to your own father. To not have a father and to not have a ruler is to be an animal. So how did Mengzi argue against these positions? Well, I'm going to uh, motivate one of his arguments by showing you um, a little video. And this is, you can find this on YouTube. Uh, it's not staged, it's an actual security camera footage. Let's just watch it together and enjoy it. Yeah, oh my God. And the kid's all right. Everybody's applauding the mom for grabbing the kid. All right, let's take a quick look at the, that again. And like, so what happens here? And as a parent, I can totally sympathize. I mean, the mom probably said something like, well, yeah, you can look out the window, be careful. And the kid starts to look and then he goes boom, over the edge. The mom grabs him. The, the delivery guy is going down the stairs uh, to help. People heard her scream and they came to help her and they pull the kid up, the kid's all okay, and everybody applauds the mom for her quick reaction. Now, what was your reaction as you saw this? How did you feel at the moment you realized, oh my God, that kid is going over the edge there? And how did you feel when you realized, oh, the mom got him, she's pulling him up, he's gonna be okay? How did you feel about that? Mengzi gives a very similar kind of example. He says, suppose someone suddenly saw a child about to fall into a well. 
everyone in such a situation would have a feeling of alarm and compassion. And this wonderful illustration of this story is by my colleague, Helen de Cruz. She's got a forthcoming book where she has a bunch of thought experiments illustrated. It's gonna be a fun book. But I mean, Mungs's point is, look, if you're honest with yourself about this thought experiment, what do you think a normal human being would feel in this situation? It says they would feel the same thing you felt when you saw that toddler go over the edge there and about to fall you know, to serious injury, if not death, that feeling of alarm and compassion. And so Mungsa says that we know that's what an unnatural human response would be in this situation. And then he goes on to say, the heart of compassion, what he means here is that feeling you had in your heart of compassion for the child, that's the sprout of benevolence, sprout of benevolence, the virtue of benevolence. The disdain you feel when you consider things that are ethically shameful, like cheating on an exam or betraying a friend, right? That ethical disdain is the sprout of righteousness. The feelings you have of deference for others, that's the sprout of propriety, which is manifested in things you do to show respect through others for social rituals. And uh, the sprout of wisdom is the general feelings of approval and disapproval you have in a variety of situations where you're trying to find the best means to achieve your goals in a practical situation. And there's a lot more you could say about each of these virtues, but the key thing here is Mungsa says, look, I'm not saying everybody's born benevolent. I'm not saying everybody's born righteous, right? Because clearly they're not. Mungsa lived in a time of warfare worse than anything any of us probably uh, have seen. And so he's not some naive guy who says, oh, everybody's all nice. He says, all I'm saying is if you're a human, there are some things you would be ashamed to do. That's the sprout of righteousness. If you're a human, there are some situations in which you'll have compassion for others. That's the sprout of benevolence. And in describing these reactions as sprouts, what he's saying is that these are innate and active but incipient tendencies, which given the right cultivation can develop into full-blown virtues, but are not yet full-blown virtues. Now, why is this so important for Mengzi? This is his response to Yang Ju. Yang Ju says, look, if we agree that heaven is something that implanted human nature in us, what could be more natural for a human than self-interest? Mengzi comes back and says, if you think about it, you'll realize that humans sometimes have compassion for others. And so there's more to human nature than just self-interest. And there's more to human nature than, than just your sensual desires. And not that your sensual desires are intrinsically bad. He's not an ascetic thinker, Mengzi is not. But he's saying there's more to you in your nature than Yangju has allowed. You have these other kinds of motivations. Now, you might not, I mean, maybe you agree with something like the view that there's a higher power that plants a nature in us and that we should follow that nature and you're entitled to that view if you have it. But what if you don't? Is there anything in Mengzi's thought for you? Well, think about what humans are according to evolutionary theory. Humans are primates. What are primates? They're social animals. And social animals survive because we cooperate with one another. And because we care about things other than pure self-interest. There's a classic essay on this topic that's often misinterpreted, a uh, Trivers, uh, The Evolution of Reciprocal Altruism. And people often mistakenly interpret it as arguing that humans are purely self-interested. Ironically, that's the exact opposite of what Trivers is arguing. Trivers is arguing that there are good evolutionary reasons for animals to develop motivations like compassion and disdain to do things like cheat others that are not purely self-interested because it helps the species survive and we can benefit from the kinds of interpersonal interactions that are facilitated by these non-selfishly, uh, non-selfish motivations. So uh, you might agree with Mengzi because you have a similar teleological view of the universe where a higher power gives a telos, a goal, a purpose to humans. But even if you don't, there could be evolutionary reasons for believing something similar.
So this is Mengzi's response to Yang Ju, but Mengzi says that it's not just the words of Yang Ju that fill the empire, it's also the words of Mengzi. So what does he say with Mengzi? There's an infamous, but also infamously difficult to interpret dialogue between Mengzi and a defender of Moism in his era by the name of Ejer. And Mengzi also refers to Ejer as Idza. Idza just means master E, it's a polite way of referring to it. And the whole uh, dialogue, which is in Mengzi 3A5 is worth looking at, but I'm gonna give you highlights of a couple of small points in it. So at one point in the debate, Mengzi says, uh, he says, does Idza, does Ejer truly hold that one's affection for one's elder brother's son, that's your nephew, is like one's affection for one's neighbor's child. Is there no difference in the way that I feel for my own children or my nephews and nieces or my grandchildren and the way that I feel for, for a random uh, person in the street? Then Mengzi says, furthermore, heaven in producing the things in the world causes them to have one source, but Idza gives them two sources. And the word source here is literally, is bun, which is literally root. So heaven gives things one root, but Idza gives them two roots. Now, this is, there's been a lot of debate about how to interpret this, but I think it's, at a certain level, Mengzi's argument is clear. What he's saying is, look, it's human nature to care more for relatives than for strangers. And so if you want to get us to believe in impartial caring like the Moists do, you're asking us to act against our human nature. Furthermore, it is inconsistent of the Moists to accept the moral authority of heaven, which they do, yet reject the moral authority of the human nature that heaven has endowed us with. So the Moists say, look, we want to follow heaven, and we believe that heaven wants us to be impartial. But then Mozza says, but look, doesn't it seem to be part of human nature that we naturally do care more for our own children than strangers' children, our own nephews and nieces than we do for strangers' children? And where did that instinct come from if not from heaven? And so therefore it's inconsistent of the Moist to on the one hand, tell us they're following heaven. And on the other hand, ask us to reject the human nature which was implanted in us by heaven. There's another argument against the Moists that I think many people miss when they read the Mengza. And ironically, it's in the very first passage. And in this passage, Mengza 1A1, Mengza had an audience with the ruler of a state, King Hui of Liang. And King Hui of Liang, he's usurped the title of king because he's not the reigning Zhou dynasty monarch, who's the only real king. But several rulers in Mengzi's era had done this. And they usurped the title of king. And so Mengzi had an audience with so-called King Hui of Liang. And the king said, sir, you've come not regarding 1,000 li as too far. Li is a unit of measure. Surely you will have something to profit my state. It's a very polite question. Mengzi's response is anything but polite. He says, why must your majesty say profit? Let there be benevolence and righteousness and that is all. Your majesty says, how can my state be profited? Well, then the counselors will say, how can my family be profited? The scholars and commoners will say, how can I be profited? Those above and those below mutually compete for profit and the state is endangered. There have been, never been those who were benevolent who abandoned their parents. There have never been those who were righteous who put their ruler last. Let your majesty say benevolence and righteousness, and that is all. Why must you say profit? Well, this is a really interesting line of argument. It's interpreted in different ways, but the interpretation I favor is Mengzi is saying that ironically, the Moists are telling us to, emphasize, to produce the most profit impartially concerned. But what will actually produce the most profit is for people not to aim at profit, but to aim at benevolence and righteousness. And in fact, getting people to think in terms of profit, even if you're trying to get them to think in terms of impartial profit, will actually backfire. 
Because once people start thinking about profit, they're going to be thinking about what will profit or benefit their state or their family or their individual, and they will be willing to act against benevolence or righteousness when it benefits them to do so. Whereas if you were a person of genuine righteousness, you will not assassinate your ruler to profit yourself because you would regard it as shameful to be someone like that. You would not abandon your parents because you would have too much benevolence to do that. So in te the technical terminology of ethics, we say that the Moa's position might be self-effacing, which means ironically, if you wanted to get the results that the Moa's are aiming at, the best way to do that would be to not endorse Moism because you would get the results that the Moas are aiming at better if you got people to actually care for other people. And the best way to do that is by following their natural instinct to care for family members and to develop the sprout of righteousness that they innately have within themselves. Well, if you'd like to learn more about any of the thinkers that we've talked about in this course. Um, in addition to the selections in readings in classical Chinese philosophy, I've also written a secondary work, Introduction to Classical Chinese Philosophy, which is key to the readings in readings in classical Chinese philosophy. Um, so you can learn more about uh, Kongzi and Muozi and Yangju and Mengzi and Shunzi and Laozi and Zhuangzi by reading Introduction to Classical Chinese Philosophy. Uh, one of my other recent books is Taking Back Philosophy, a Multicultural Manifesto, where I talk about why I think it would be valuable to include more Chinese philosophy in the Western philosophical curriculum, the way people like Professor Tompio are doing now. And you can also check out my website. Uh, it's right there, brianvannorden.com, where I've got a bibliography of primary translations and secondary readings on not just Chinese philosophy, but also Indian philosophy and uh, Africana philosophy and indigenous American philosophy. Um, and so you can learn some more about that. And also I've got links to some of my uh, articles on these topics if you'd like to learn more. And I've also got a video series on YouTube for a course I just taught on later Chinese philosophy where we talk about uh, particularly Confucianism and Buddhism in the later Chinese tradition. So, but thank you so much for listening to me today, and I look forward to your questions.